Walter Kattner, who is right here, has just completed his book, Pages from Paradise. And he will read to you from it. And afterwards, there will be time for questions. So if you have any, maybe write them down. As we said in the lecture on Tuesday, Mr. Kattner was born in Germany into a family of non-observant Jews and lived in Berlin during his youth. In 1934, he moved to Spain to join his uncle's family who had fled Nazi Germany the year before. When the Spanish Civil War broke out in 1936, the Kattners evacuated. Eventually, Walter and his relatives moved to Texas. But today, he and his wife, Sharon, live in Santa Rosa. And also, Walter is a long-time member of the Alliance for the Study of the Holocaust. So please welcome Mr. Walter. It's a personal refuge in 1934. I want you to observe the similarity between Nazism, Italian fascism, and the Spanish Falange movement how they, like contagious disease, can affect various societies if they're not resisted. For that matter, of course, the Soviet Union had their own status, and so have characters like Saddam Hussein, who use their people instead of serving the, the population of the country. While I was in Germany, what we would call here junior in high school, Hitler came to power. Nobody could at first have imagined what a reign of terror the Nazis would eventually establish. However, from the very first beginning, there could be no doubt that the Jewish part of the population would be the victim, though they amounted only to between 1 and 2 percent of the German people. That Jews would eventually be murdered on a wholesale basis did not become clear until much later. Many Jews lived in the food paradigm and kept, me, kept after me to come and join. At first, my abitur, that would be the graduation certificate, seemed all important to me, but then the Nazi decrease came out which forbade university study to Jews. I finally woke up, left school without graduating, accepted my uncle's offer and got it on a train to Spain by way of France. To give you an example showing that my family lived truly in Spain, my aunt and uncle traveled by streetcar to the harbor to pick me up at the landing pier of the motor ship from Barcelona. My suitcase and I traveled back with them. I lived with them for two and a half years, working in the small stationery store which my uncle financed and my cousin's husband and I put together. Perhaps it is sad, sad to be in exile, but I'm sure the grown-ups suffered more than I did because I had my own teenage timetable to grow up and to learn somehow how to make a living without college. I was 17 years old when I arrived on Mallorca at an outdoor dance on the economic downturn that preceded the Fed Civil War. In the summer of 36, the year when the Olympic Games were held in Berlin, the Civil War broke out in Spain. My uncle was a British subject and we were evacuated by a French liner escorted by a British gunboat. When we arrived in Switzerland, first of all, we all traveled to Zurich to apply for United States visas. Ten months, mine came through. Mine was the only one in the family, possibly because I was just the right age for the United States Army. I already told you that my correspondence with my Mallorca girlfriend lasted until my embarkation to go to the United States. Now comes a very fast forward of my story. About 48 years later, the next Mallorcan I met in the 1980s in Petaluma High School, where after retiring, I worked as a ling bilingual instructional assistant. They were both high school seniors in Sonoma County as exchange students. My wife and I repeatedly invited them to our house, and of course, Anna Salas wanted to know if I had a girlfriend when I lived in Palma, New York, whom I later on called Andrea. So we won't, she won't uh, sue me if it turns out that she is still a devoted Catholic, and in the book I let her uh, become something else. And she might sue me, you know, so I call her Andrea in my book instead of Anita. But, uh, so since, since you are of such a nice young age, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to read a little bit of the diary page of 
Andrea of when she met me. I hesitated when cousin Rafaela suggested to me that I should go with her to the outdoor dance at Cyberdolph and I held her when I asked her for time to think the idea over. When I said that I would go finally, we agreed that I had to wear black because mother died only five months ago. At that dance, I could for a while get away from our apartment and acting like the housewife I do not want to be. I know mother would forgive me and understand. And soon afterward, how interesting it was to hear about life in England, what he thought about, in which we were similar and how we were different. I briefly wondered how Peggy would handle the situation. No longer worried that Cyber Dalton would think of the sea if I took the initiative. When I got up from my folding chair, Raphaela spread her arms wide, shrugged her shoulders, and stared at me in surprise. But I walked a few steps toward the tall young man. In that second, I realized he was short, but a little taller than I. He saw me coming and smiled at me, saying, Hola, senorita. I greeted him with a nod, and he introduced himself. After a couple of tries, I managed to pronounce his name Walter fairly well. He seemed not, uh, to have any problems pronouncing Andrea, and to my surprise, said with a smile, I just love, love the sound of the letter A. Ah, I have only one in Walter, but you have two in Andrea. That's great. I just had to play along with this vowels game and told him, my friend's name is Rafaela. Would you then refer because of three A's in her name? That's what her father-in-law speak. So uh, the room was small enough that he didn't need a microphone. This is the homecoming, he said, for my wife Esther and me. It's not only a homecoming, but also a welcome to my new wonderful daughter Andrea and to our family. If you wonder why I say homecoming, let me explain. As some of you may know, our ancestors left from here or somewhere near here during the time of the Inquisition around the 16th century, so that they did not have to give up their religion. Some of you descend from people who, like we, worship God in the manner of the Jew. In order to stay alive and sometimes even fully believe in the teachings of the church, your ancestors became Catholics. So most of you go to church, take the sacrament, and have your children baptized. As we all know, your country is coming out of the tragic period of civil war. New Spain is evolving. Your political leader, Francisco Franco, thank God, now guarantees religious toleration in Spain. Remembering the horror and cruelty of civil order, I guess you, you want to have your visa. Go ahead and good luck. And another thing he said, and they just slayed me. Uh, this has really nothing to do with Holocaust, but, but just with America and what, what a strange picture it's something presented for a foreigner. He said, Walter, when you get to the harbor of New York, some people with all sorts of scrambled eggs on their, uh, on their caps are going to come in. That's the, the Immigration and Naturalization Service. And when they ask you what you're going to do, you tell them you're going to study. When you're down that can plank, you can do any damn thing you want to. You can get yourself a job. You're in a free country. And of course, I wish I had pursued what, what I was supposed to do, namely study. But at the time, I had ideas that uh, all you could do is study like you did in Germany. You become a full-time student, and uh, for that, you need money. I did a big continent. They eventually took his government to Taipei, as you probably know. But uh, so, so lots and lots of people left the country, but unfortunately, they were the minority. The great majority of German Jews and of the Eastern Jews, which the Nazis eventually conquered, uh, perished in the extermination camps or in concentration camps where they were worked to death. You have, I'm sure, learned about that in the in the course, in the Holocaust course. Uh, I, I want to caution you about one thing because I'm always reluctant to call myself a Holocaust survivor because Nobody made things very rough for me, and I, I don't really have any complaints. So, but the fact when people like I, because of circumstances and nice people that came their way, were lucky. As you grow up, learn all you can about Judaism, about the religion of your ancestors, and live by those rules. 
you will have a much better and a much happier life if you do. And I mean, I hate to use such a such a stupid expression, but you could have knocked me over with a feather. I mean, that was certainly not what I expected. And it took me years to to try to work out this man's motivation. And one of the portions of the book, the latter part of the book, is I I have my heroine meet meet this uh, priest whom I make a member of a crypto-Jewish family. Crypto-Jews were a phenomenon that had, that managed, there were people that managed to live through the Inquisition period pretending to be Catholic. yelled at him like I did, or his absence would have happened anyway. Andrea, tomorrow, please call the school's office on the telephone or go there and find out what happened. I will do it, but we are so short-handed in the power plants that I cannot take time off to attend to this. He works for the power plant. I felt awful, but I did not want to make my poor father feel worse than I knew he did. Just imagine, within a few days of each other, one son goes off to the arm of the government, government and the other arm disappears from home. Suddenly, both of my brothers are gone. I slept very little during the night. In my dream, this frightening scene occurred. I saw Jose aiming a rifle at a soldier who pursed him among a group of enemies. Suddenly, I found myself looking through the rifle side, and there at the side of a tree, Hector stood aiming a gun at me. I cried out aloud, don't shoot, and woke up shouting and crying. That was in the middle of the night, and only with difficulty, I went back to disturb sleep. Waking up the next morning, this morning, the buses were running without with the purple smudge paper into my purse and walked out. Coming out of the shady school, the oppressive noise summer heat engulfed me like the embrace of a furry animal. My chill of fear had given way to a glowing frustration and fury at our home and surrender to the rebel. Simply as I thought, because our government, Goldor was in league with crime. I walked on the shady side of the street under the clock clock of human ass watch shop that showed 9.45. I skirted Plaza Cortes, walking through side streets to avoid the embarrassing hand on your head maneuver. No bus came in our direction. All vehicular traffic was light. Soldiers and parliamentarians strode among us civilians, but nobody stopped me on the way home. Uh, What Andrea does go is a seamstress who makes dresses for the ladies. And she had started an apprenticeship there and she continues the apprenticeship now. And uh, so because in November I went to see Annette Montoya, uh, the owner of the shop where I started my dressmaking apprenticeship. She was happy to let me come back. She paid me close to the weight of a fully trained modista for the next year and a half. After that, I'll do better. We have six women of various, varying ages in the shop, but I only know one of them from before. The better off ladies of Prama are beginning to start dressing up again now that our civil war is over and something close to regular life is developing. A few of our higher class girls are beginning to carry ready-made dresses from the mainland, though they are too expensive for most working people. Many of our, our professionals in, and, in our and other dressmaking shops believe that it won't be long before women will quit sewing their own clothes and will no longer have them made. Instead, they go to stores that will be a little like looking for a magazine or newspaper you want in a news kiosk. The stores can probably man, make minor alterations to compensate for differences in customers' anatomy. Maybe the same idea can be applied to casual clothes. And that kind of thing would be a little easier to make. This is actually the business that she goes into. She, she makes beach clothes, which uh, tourists have found were that they, you know, the people that brought uh, leisure clothes from, from England or from Germany or from Scandinavian countries where they live, found in Mallorca that was too heavy and really not not the right way. And she, uh, she really makes a success of this uh, 
of this uh, company that makes play, play suits. And uh, who wants to buy a book, uh, you can do it during this question period. And it's a very decent thing that uh, the book, in, if you were to go to Copperfield, you would have to pay $22.99, and the college bookstore has lowered the price to $20. I, I think that's a very nice thing. When, when, when I was a student, and I don't mean a student here, I didn't have much money either. <laughs> Do you have any questions? It so happens, this very same thing happened. Uh, my girlfriend's name was really Anita, but uh, I give her the name Andrea in the book just in case she's still a rip-roaring Catholic, and in this book I let her try to become a Jew. And Any other question, please? I'm well, you may want to, uh, you may want to know why I picked this strange method of self-publishing. It's unfortunate. The book business has gotten into, into a difficulty. Uh, there are thousands and thousands of books, and uh, the uh, book publishers have a, a commercially very unsound method of printing thousands and thousands of, of books that any, anybody that somebody uh, decided to, to write, and then unless it happens to be a John Grisham or whatever, they have remained us over and then have to sell them at bargain prices, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's bad business, so, so they got